formally no different than ontological. Okay, we want to welcome everybody to the um, to the um, continuing lectures on the the section of the Rambam, which deals with what is commonly known as his negative theology. And um, this is the tenth lecture, and we're up to Perak Nuntes, chapter fifty-nine of the first section of the guide. And once again, is always. And as very recently, I will exclusively use the, um, the Hebrew translation, translation of Lashon HaKodesh, of uh, Professor Michael Schwartz, and Parak Nuntes, chapter 59, is located on page 147. Is the camera fine? Everything all right? Sounds good. Okay, fine. I'm going to wing it a prayer. Um, the camera broke, the camera which we've had ultimately, and we're using a different camera until we get it fixed, until we find out what's, uh, what's wrong with it. Um, and, uh, Hashem, well, you soil. It's another camera. Okay, fine, now. Like rabbis. What? They're like rabbis. One like rabbis. One, one goes down, you find another one. <laughs> <laughs> the Gemara says in your test of the Nazar, you're supposed to have two rabbis, one for Sfala and one for Sfala. Okay, so we still have lots of them. Two cameras, one for Swire, one for Masada. Okay, fine. Okay, now. I'll go ahead and steal it. Okay, anyway. I'm sure Rashi and Lashel Vulaimah. Let's go further. Okay, we have some very interesting things today. I just want to give everybody a warning. The Marna Vulchim is going to get more difficult and more interesting. Does that, does that, does that, does that, does it, that does not mean the two things are synonymous, but it will be a coincidence that that's going to be true. Now. Says the Rambam, Hashar Hashar Lashovalaimba. One can ask, was permitted to ask, Im ein takboy lahasik is a misas asbusa. If there's no possible way that one can apprehend God's essence, for a chacha mimsis blamedes shemash masikim hurakshu nimsa, and the only thing that we can actually ascertain is his existence. That's it. And that positive attributes are impossible, as we've rigorously proven. And means we've rigorously and, you know, um, and rationally proven. So therefore, how do you count, how, how do you count for differences between people? Why is one person considered to be on a higher level than another person? Or, right? In other words, in what, in what way do we say that Moshe Rabbeinu and Shlomo HaMelech, it's interesting that Rabbeinu picked Shlomo HaMelech, in what way do we say that Moshe Rabbeinu and Shlomo HaMelech apprehended more than, uh, you know, than one of the Talmudim, one of the students? In other words, right? How can a person, in fact, actually Reach higher apprehensions of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Read Eimah Fusim and Anshat Teirav Yisrael. They say we have been philosophers. We have done all about. But now, who's to say that Moshe Rabbeinu actually ascertained things? The Rambam says, "Well, it's a, it's a double. You know, it, it, it's it's clear. It's obvious." But Anshat Teirav by people who learned the Teirav, and even more from philosophers, that in fact, actually, that there are, is a hierarchy of people, and in in in, in um, you know what commensable with their apprehension. In other words, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 you would say in yeshiva, it's a metzias. It's an obvious fact of life that there are certain people who have greater apprehensions than other people. So how do we account for this? In what way can we define a high level of apprehension? Da Eifel, says the Rampa, Shadova Hukach, Shahebdel b'mayla ben amasikim u'godlom You should know something, that there is a, um, a great difference between the levels of people of people in their capacity to apprehend God. She can go come as she was seeing the Torah, to her who is Yaschid Yaiser. In other words, certainly, says the Rambam. In other words, the more we increase, in other words, um, the more, in other words, what we increase, um, the, the more we describe something, the more it makes something unique. The hamitai er kol v'yisal hasik is tamisosay. So they're like this. Just like, for example, the more I describe something, the more unique I make the object. So, too, 
With respect to God, it operates in the same way, but in a negative sense. Namely, the more I negate with respect to God, the more, in fact, a person approaches to apprehend him. In other words, it says the Rambam is that precisely the more I understand what God is not, the more I apprehend God. In other words, God's apprehension, right, is in fact commensurable with what we would call the ability to negate, the ability to understand what he is not. But the idea is that, that my apprehension increases positively, or I've just moved, I've moved away, gonna, farther gonna, away from a bad... We're going to speak about this. We're going to speak about this. There's a whole shtickle here in the Rambam, and we're going to speak about this. Emir Hashem. I claim there is a positive apprehension, but we're going to speak about it. In other words, in fact, actually, we'll, we'll see in a little while. So it says the Rambam, so it says the Rambam, so it says a person can spend a long time on something, on a specific uh, field of knowledge, right? And uh, it takes a long time until he achieves, right, a very deep and true insight, right, into what is true. So what's the wisdom of God? What's the wisdom of God? The wisdom of God is not what we're left to um, believe in so many popular books on religion and science, and Judaism and science, but the wisdom of God is how much we're able to shoyle, to negate, right? Something about God, which we know has to be true through um, rational proof. In other words, the more we understand why we cannot attribute things to God, the more we understand more deeply what God is. Now, so in other words, a person can spend a long time, a lifetime, in reaching a level in which, in other words, he is truly negated, right? Most things as not being being other than God. But another person, for example, is not convinced or doesn't really appreciate the proof that God cannot be described positively. You know, it could possibly that he might have a suffix. Perhaps maybe I can offer an, a positive attribute of a there could be a person who's blind in his apprehension. He'll hold, right, that really, in fact, I have to describe God. In other words, um, I mean, in other words, basically, um, in other words, that, in other words, a person. My, you know what, a person, in fact, actually, um, might, in fact, actually, um, describe, think that Kosh Baruch is a body. For Achi, he told something, Loida, he moved goof, where no goof. A person might think, as a suffering, as a good, doesn't have a goof. For Achi, he was like, she'll goof, you have to be cut in a spinach, kill me, take a monazu. You know what, Ram is admitting that some people can believe that Kosh Baruch was a body. And there's a big difference between these people, right? The person, who's convinced, right, that it's been proven that God cannot be described positively, right? And the second one, and he's closer to God. He's closer to God. The person who understands the truth of the impossibility of describing God, the truth of negative theology, he's the closest one to God. The second, walking man was further from him, but she's even more, more, more than him. Right? In other words, the fourth one, right? Right? In other words, basically, in other words, basically, the Ram says there's a hierarchy of people to the extent to which they apprehend the true meaning of that God cannot have any positive attributes. Okay, now, so, goes on the Rambam and says the following thing. I want to go over to page 148. Right? Right? Says the Rambam, When a person has reached the 
it's been become clear to the person on page 148, second line. In other words, that it's impossible you can say many things about you can't say many things about God. This person is, has achieved the greatest level. In other words, the more you understand the Ram, the more you understand that something cannot be said about God, the more shalai, the more perfect you are. Right? And the more you think that you can say something about God, Basically, you're living in an illusion. You're fooling yourself. And you're very far from understanding the truth of God. Okay, now, comes the Rambam and says, from this standpoint, as a result of this, right? so how does a person come close to God? Or come close to ascertaining the truth of God? From this standpoint, says the Rambam, it is fitting that a person should come to apprehend God through investigation, through study, until he understands everything which can not be said about God. But you shouldn't come, think to come close to God by trying to discover what you can say about God. Oi, or says the Gamba, Bibhida Shay Ignazu Shlem is the Gabbaf. A person shouldn't come to God by thinking about what is a what is called a divine perfection. What's perfect about God? Says the Ram, you can't do that. Became a chatamitz oysa shu shlem is the gabbaf. Just because you think it's perfection in man. Here's a very important statement of the Ramba. Don't think that a perfection that we attribute to human beings is a perfection, is a divine perfection. Don't think like that. Sharei says the Rambam, call a shlemius, hein tzgulas kol shehein. Because really perfections are things that, well, tzgulias, he brings to the bottom, the Arabic, which means things that are required. For like kol tzgulas nimtzis, to call me shesu tzgulas. Not every perfect person who's perfect, right, has every perfection. What I understand is da, old, no addition, in other words, when, so it says the Rambam, when we attribute God something, and we think that God possesses this positive attribute, it's actually distant from God for two reasons. Number one says the Rambam, one, because we tend to attribute to God perfections, which in fact are only perfections from our standpoint, and they're not perfections of God. And secondly, In other words, the author is God's essence. His perfection can only be his essence, what he is. Kavishi have like me explained. I see in the Rambam, what I would say is an implicit criticism of other beliefs, perhaps Christianity, and we'll see actually other philosophers too, that somehow look as God is the most perfect, as the most, Perfect being. Says the Rambam, perfection is really, in a certain sense, a human concept. We can attribute perfection to a human being. We can't attribute perfection to God. Now, this is a very, very important, very crucial statement. It's one of the most crucial paragraphs of the Rambam, at least certainly on page 148. <laughs> Why is this a crucial paragraph? For the following thing. Number one is, is that we spoke last week about the ontological proof. Right? The ontological proof, which is a, has a long history from, the, um, from St. Anselm right, to Descartes, to Leibniz, to Kant, and right, so on and so forth, to Gödel, Malcolm Wilk, right? We claimed, I claimed last week, that the Rambam would have rejected the ontological proof. Right? We gave reasons, I'm going to go back on the Shia last week. Time, but actually, I think there's even a, a deeper reason why he rejected our topic proof. At least the version, which was taken up by Descartes and demolished by Kant. The version of the ontological proof 
which according to many scholars was Anselm's first ontological proof. That became the most famous ontological proof, at least, you know, for Descartes and Leibniz and Kant. Two, two Schumacher. What? Two oh, two Schumacher, Schumacher right? It was basically that if we define God as the most perfect being, then he must exist, because existence, right, is a type of perfection. But clearly the Ram would reject that. The Ram, according to the Ram, you, wouldn't, you, you couldn't get the first base. You can't define God as the most perfect being and then pick an attribute which is his perfection. Perfection is not an attribute for God. It's at war with who he is. In other words, perfection is not an attribute. Perfection is a human attribute. It's not a divine attribute. So you can't say God's the most perfect human being and decide that an attribute must necessarily be true of God because it's a perfection. There's no attribute that I can assume or, or that I can suppose the perfection of God because God's perfection is not an attribute. It's just in one with his essence, with who he is. So in other words, the Rambam certainly would not call a Kabbalist Bokh the most perfect human being. Now there is actually, the Rambam does in several places speak about that God is the most sholem, but he speaks about his most perfection in terms of his existence. He has the most perfect existence because he necessarily exists, which might be related to Anselm's second proof, which I don't want to go into right now. I don't know what's right now. That's another Shia, another Shtikl Teira. We have to wait for that. But in any case, in other words, no question about it, perfection of God is probably a more of a Christian concept. And God exhibits perfections which we associate with human beings. The Rambam, and I take upon the full responsibility of saying this, the Rambam would probably understand that ascribing to God perfection is idolatrous. It's a bizarre, idolatrous. Christianity, which assigns to God perfection, is a bizarre. It's philosophical idolatry. Because assigning something perfection, ultimately for the Ramba, would be assigning him something which is human. And this, in fact, actually goes back to what the Ramba writes about in the, very, in the second chapter of the first volume. There the Rambam, after in Perak Aleph, chapter 1, speaks about Selamela Kim as denoting man's intellect, what man shares in common with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is his intellect, that's called Selamela Kim. The Rambam, in the second chapter of the Merit of Ocha, that's this volume, volume 1, in the Schwartz edition on page 32, raises a question. Gosh, it was asked of him that if, as a result of the height of Adam Berishin, the sin of man, of Adam, of Adam, he ate from the Eitz Das, he ate from the tree of knowledge, and then he was granted Das, quote unquote knowledge, how could you consider it to be a height? How could you consider it to a sin? I mean, isn't knowledge, doesn't knowledge, isn't knowledge the greatest description of man? Isn't knowledge that which we, uh, w on which we say a man is created in the image of God in Salomon Okin. So the Rambam, after giving him a little bit of shtach, the fish of shtach, says that that's not true. In other words, before man, before the Barishan ate from the Itzadas, the man was able to understand what one would call, right, theoretical truths. In other words, theoretical truths. Once man eats from the Itzadas, now he becomes, um, he, in other words, he becomes aware of what you would call truths, which are not theoretical truths, in other words, true and false, but rather opinions. Opinions. In other words, beauty is beautiful, this is ugly, and Pashas of the Rambam, is this good, is this bad? In other words, the Rambam, now most people understand that the Rambam, is here differentiating between ontology and ethics. In other words, ontology is stating what exists, true and false. Ethics is when a person offers his opinions. I think we've spoken about this already, and um, we've discussed the controversy on this, but in other words, being, believing, in my opinion, in a certain sense, the Rambam did distinguish ontology and ethics, at least, you know, in, in most cases, um, would understand that human perfection Human perfection 
is not a theoretical truth. It's a human truth. Perfection. This is good. This is not good. And those when we when we assign a perfection to something, what we do is we're giving our opinion. Something is beautiful as opposed to ugly. Something tastes good as opposed to not tasting good. Or you know, when something is good as opposed to being too evil. In other words, perfection, as I understand this, is a quote unquote what the Rabbin calls, you know, what accepted truths, social truths, and not theoretical truths. So therefore, to assign to God a social truth where God is, you know, I mean, God, well, what characterizes God is absolute truth, theoretical truth, right? True and false, right? Ultimately, is pitting ethics on ontology, and that for the Rambam would be, in fact, actually, you know, uh, idolatrous. So in other words, the, in other words, pitting on a Kodesh Baruch Hu, human, Opinions is another form of idolatry, and basically, um, in a certain sense, it's a consequence of the chayt of adoration. It's a das. Now, going back to this, right? Going back to this, there's another important thing here too. Is we found here a little bit of a, a call a steel, a contradiction in the Magen Fulchim. and what's the steel? The Rambam has told us. What constitutes Moshe Rabbeinu's apprehension of God? In other words, says the Rambam, it's rather obvious that Moshe Rabbeinu had the highest apprehension of God. Says the Rambam was the apprehension of God. The apprehension of God, right, achieves this higher level when a person is able to negate him as much as possible. In other words, the more I negate of God, the higher my apprehension of God. So we'd have to assume that the people who are Masik, who apprehended God at the highest level, which Moshe Rabbeinu names are Moshe, are, are Moshe Rabbeinu and Shlomo Melech, interesting. Then, in fact, we have to say, according to the Rambam, that their, their ability to negate, their ability to say what God is not, reaches its highest level. In other words, their ability to negate was higher level. So Moshe has the question, I mean, so... How is that positive? But the fact is, we see a different definition of this. A Moshe Rabbeinu's Chachma, apprehension, we see a different version of this. We saw it in Parak Nundal, chapter 54. We go back to page 130, 131. There, the Rambam was, in fact, going through, reading for us the Psukim in Shmois, in Pasuk Yisisa. And there, Moshe Rabbeinu looks and desires to see, to ask God of his essence. He also asked the God, you know, why is that tzaddik v'ra'ala? In other words, why do Kodesh Baruch punish people? What is the source of his um, of divine punishment reward? And it's interesting, the Pasuk says there, Ani avi kol tibi al panecha. I'm going to pass all of my goodness in front of you. And the Rambam says, what does this mean? What this means is, says the Rambam, I'm reading now from page 131, the Rambam says the Kodesh Baruch Hu presented to him the true nature and connection between all parts of, of nature. In other words, the Rambam present, I mean, sorry, the Kodesh Baruch Hu presented to Moshe Rabbeinu the ultimate ontology of the world. How everything is connected, how every, the basis of all of nature and the interconnectedness of the entire world. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu was given, was was shown the grand unified field theory in a way which if five physicists could not even imagine it. He was shown the interconnectedness of every aspect of the creation. Which is interesting, is that in Parak Nundalek, if I would ask you, how does the Rambam understand Moshe Bedu's heightened apprehension of God, you would have answered me by saying, well, it's clear. Or, or by the way, that apprehension apprehension of God, he would ask to me, how would I define Moshe Benu's level of apprehension? Why is it higher than anybody else? I think the obvious answer would be, well, it's very good. If a Kodesh Baruch Hu shows you the theory of all theories, the grand unified field theory, in which it connects every aspect of whether it's, whether it's elementary particles, whether it's biology, RNA, DNA, the whole work, strings, right? Then, I mean, that's not a greater apprehension? Now, it is true that you could say, well, what is the apprehension of the world? It wasn't a great apprehension of God. But the fact is that what defines Moshe Rabbeinu's intellectual heights? 
In other words, clearly a nun dollar. If I, if, if, I mean, if I would ask the question, why is Moshe Rabbeinu apprehend more than any other people? So in you would say, well, because Baruch Hashem, the Grand Unified Field the Theory. That's not enough? Why does the Rambam have to look, have to go searching for a, another definition of Moshe Rabbeinu's greater apprehension of God? In order, for sure, this, this is not a stira, this is not a contradiction of the Marna Volcher. Al Koch, we're forced to say, as a result of this, is that really what the Rambam is saying is the following thing. What does it mean to say that I apprehend God by negating more of Him? The answer would be, is the more I understand the world, the more I'm able to understand aspects, every aspect of the world, then the greater I have a positive knowledge of the world, of the creation, the more I'm able to say, is not him, with a capital H. In other words, my forced intellectual apprehension of the wisdom and interconnectedness and of the underlying logic of nature and of the world is ipso facto leads me towards a greater, towards piling on more things which are not God and therefore is a greater apprehension of God. In other words, the more I know about the world, the more I know that which is not God, and therefore my greater apprehension of God. The Rav Cook point the Rav Ah, ah, so the mind, what's interesting is, the Rambam would say, and this is something that I mentioned for Rav Cook, is that as science progresses and gives me more knowledge of the world, my apprehension of God is greater. What? Because I know more of what God isn't. Why do I need both definitions uh, in order to come to this? I'll tell you why. Because how do I know, how do I know what, you see, it's kind of like this. How do I know what, how do I know more and more what is not God? I have to know more and more what is. The more I know more and more what is, the more I know what is God. And let me give you a, 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 a dogma, an example, that will make this even clearer. Um, those of you who have followed my lectures on the part of creation of the Rambam. So, and if you haven't followed them, you certainly, if you've, you know, if you learn, if you learn the Bernabal I mean, um, no one can fail to, you know, to, um, to notice a very famous contradiction in the Rambam. On one hand, the Rambam in his um, states that the um, opinion of the Torah is that a Kodesh Baruch God created the world um, is, is that, in fact, actually, in the words, go out for ex nihilo. And we mention there that, in fact, in the Rambam's proof of God's existence and corporeality, the Rambam assumed the, um, the eternity of time. And I spoke about that contradiction. But I want to focus back on that proof. The Rambam's proof of God's incorporeality in the first chapter of the second section of the guide uses the eternity of time. It rests upon that. That why is it rest upon that? Because how do I prove God's incorporeal? I have to sort of like push him out of the world. Now how do I push him out of the world? For the Rambam as well for, for Aristotle, physically the world was bound. The Rambam, the Aristotle didn't believe the universe was infinite. So how do I push God push out of the world? I have to posit that time is infinite. Since time is infinite, God necessarily is not corporal, because anything which is finite in time is possessed of what's called finite energy. You know, I have to assume that every possibility of anything that happened in the history of nature already happened. So in other words, what does the government have to do? In order to achieve God's incorporeality, I have to stretch the universe, meaning the temporal parameter of the universe, I have to stretch it out to infinity. Only then can I achieve an incorporeality of God. So in other words, the device that I use in order to understand God's reality is basically pushing out the boundaries of the physical world. Now I claim really negative theology is really, in a certain sense, the analogy of this, but only in the, in the, in the not in the terms of a proof, but in terms of a, a theology. In other words, to achieve knowledge of God's negative essence, means that God is cannot be described in terms of positive attributes, I basically have to discover more facts about 
true, more positive attribute about the world in order to, in fact, ascertain that God is not these things. This, as Rav Kook says, heightens my sense of a Kaddish Baruch of God as being, in fact, none other than the world. That's called the greater and deeper understanding and apprehension of God. So I think that the, really, that's the Rambam's Yisrael. I mean, you know, I'm not saying chas v'shalom that you can't, uh, that people, uh, you can't get Hamish for the Kaddish Baruch, that you can't, you know, be mizdabek by oil unless you know science. But, I don't want to say that chas v'shalom, but on the other hand, though, there's no question about it, that Rambam would say the Shalom certainly doesn't hurt. And the fact that, and we've spoken about this already, several times already, the fact is, is that things that people comprehended were not part of natural order becoming increasingly part of natural order. You know, I mean, whether it be randomness, whether it be um, new different types of physical theories, possible universes. In other words, already God has not only been pushed out of the physical world, he's been pushed out of the mathematical world, and pushed out of the holographic universe. I mean, actually, God's negativity is actually getting incredible heights. We don't appreciate that, but that's what scientists are doing for us. Thank you very much, scientists of the world. Even though um, maybe the scientists are not doing it lishma, the they're actually doing it just to prove that there isn't a Kaddish Baruch Hu. But, um, you know, the, the famous vod from a wife's grandfather, that why are the grandchildren of Haman teaching Terem Ben Evrak? So, my wife's grandfather said that Haman did a Kiddush Hashem. Because by pursuing the Jewish people and then being killed, basically then made a Kiddush, Kiddush Hashem in the world. And, you know, Kiddush Hashem has nothing to do with a person's intention. It's a Metziah, it happens. You, you're involved in the Kiddush Hashem, whether you did intentionally or unintentionally, then that's a schuss for you. And therefore, his grandchildren are teaching Terim Ben Avrak. So even though the scientists are probably, you know, running around and trying to prove that there's no God because we can explain everything in science, the fact that they're doing for intelligent, you know, from people, a tremendous service. What they're doing is they're just heightening our apprehension of a Kaddish Baruch and then we can really say that actually we're gaining and understanding God in the sense of the Marina Volchim. So thank you very much, all of you atheist scientists. You're doing a tremendous help for Klai Yisrael. I think that, you know, that really, if a person really understands the Rambam, you should really, really mock a toif to all the scientists that are trying to push the universe out as far as possible. Baruch Hashem. The irony in Rambam, then, is, yeah. that, is that a person comes to love God by learning science, and at the same time, learning science shows a person that, that there's no possible way of connecting to God and there is no God. We're going to speak about this. We're going to get to this. Let me see your you friend, you you said, yeah, and we're going to get to this a little while. In fact, actually, that's actually the next part of the, um, the Rambam. The Rambam is now is going to speak about actually prayer and tefillah. In other words, if this concept of God is so negative in, its, in what it is, so how do I relate to God? Where's the Tate? Where's the Tate? We'll speak about this in Yat Hashem very, very soon. That's the next section of the Rambam test. Okay, now. Okay, very good. So, basically, this is the significance here of this paragraph. It's a very important paragraph of the Mayan of Uchen. Um, right? So the Rambam says, let's just go to page 149, let's give over a paragraph, I just want to go to the final mascot of the Rambam. In other words, basically, you should speak a lot about this, there's no point, there's no point in, in repeating it over. In other words, the Rambam says, the thing is the most aptly said in Tehillim and Psalms, in other words, your, your, your silence is your prayers. And I think if you look at the second volume of Rashima, we have actually a... Or a first volume. First volume. First volume. There's actually an article, right, of the, your silence is your praise. In other words, basically, the greatest way you can praise God is being silent. Could be something about silence. How are you going to say this thing about silence? Pascal. Someone says about silence. About silence. It's a famous phrase. Okay, besides Chazal. Zed bi to kalem ma'oid l'mashpo, zoi shemei kol dov shenom ha mitoi chalaz v'mein l'far bo, dimtza bo pegiyah kol shi kalav v'nira bo chesan kol shi. The more we speak about, we try to speak and describe God, the more it's a chesan. In other words, it back, for speaking about God is actually backfire, because the more we speak about God, the, we make him lower. L'chach roi yoyser l'shtoik, it's better to be quiet, says the Rambam, the Rambam now is taking a sort of like a poetic break. Would stamp stamp send tefisa sa seichel just rely upon the seichel stop speaking. Kavish etzivu ashleimim v'omu like like as has been said. Imu belvachim al mishkavchem b'dayim usela. Right, basically saying your hearts as you lie down and be quiet. I mean, 
in Gemara and Brachas learns this being about Kush Balamid, so maybe we're supposed to reflect upon the name of theology before we go to sleep. Now, I don't see that as being a dinner in Kush Balamid, but anyway, perhaps according to the Mayna Volchen, there's a sniff. Okay, now, after the Ram has established that, he's going to bring a ride from Chazal. Interesting. Bring a ride from Chazal. In other words, in fact, actually, um, this ride from Chazal is rather important because this is a central question in negative theology. If a Kaddish Baruch Hu is so far, so unlike anything that exists, how do I relate to him? What's my connection to God? How do I, how do I dive in? How do I pray? What is a prayer? The basic act of prayer, what is it? Who am I praying to? And certainly, that's number one. And number two, certainly, I mean, how can we claim that the Jewish concept of God is negative when in fact the liturgy, not to mention the scriptures, are filled with descriptions of God? Open up the Chumash, open up the Siddur. I mean, Judaism, whether it be scripture, whether it be liturgy, is, 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 I mean, abounds with all different types of descriptions of God. How is that possible, given what the Rambam is saying? This is the problem, the Rambam. This is the central question. And the Rambam is going to address this right now. Says the Rambam, I'm on page 149, the second paragraph. This is, it says the Rambam is a great statement. Halavai, every statement is as great as this. I'm not sure what that means. It probably means it's a higher for the Rambam. I'll abide that every statement of the Chazal will be a for what I'm saying. But in any case, this is the Rambam statement. I'm going to quote it the way it is. I'm going to quote it verbatim. Even though people remember it, I'm going to quote it. Even though everybody's supposed to remember it, you'll know it. I'm sure you'll know be out there. I'm going to quote it anyway, says the Rambam. So that you should really think about it. Very interesting. Why is the Rambam saying this? I'm going to, even though you all know it, I'm going to write it for you. Write it down for you. You know, I play life imitates art. The Rambam's decided it's going to be as I look at words I reflect upon it, that's our relationship with God. So life imitates art. I'm going to write it down to reflect upon the statement, and therefore what you're doing is, it's a parody of your relationship to Kodesh Baruch That's the Pshat of the Rambam. Okay, fine. Anyway, now. Hey, Mamu! Chazal say. What a great sefer. It's a command in Blachas, 433 side B, in your article edition. Who the Nachas come into Rabchanina? A person davened, I guess, in the presence of Abchanin. Oma! Nach has been jailed to go down, because we know a shlir tzibor is jailed of Le'a Teva. If the Magan Avram says in Shukhanak that actually the shlir tzibor stand should be lower than the rest of the Mespalu. So what did this guy say? He was davening Shema Nesrei, Chazor Hashatz, and he said, I can't go like Yibu Vanera, and then he added, Ha'odir, Ha'chazak, Ha'yeroi, Ha'ozuz. He was adding, adding a few more superlatives. Omale. So, Abchalina said to him, Simtina lekulu shimchi dabarech. Are you finished? I mean, that's all the accolade you have of, of your master for Kodesh Baruch He said, Hash to Adat Las Kamesi Lamali to Ben Amesha Abenu Barais and Vasa Jikadeza Kedunu Vatitna Lepafila Adat Lo Yachilu Lememreino. The first three accolades, Akel Agadol Agibu Vanoira. Had Moshe Rabbeinu not said them in the Torah, and had the object of his Gedolah not established the literature of the Tzvila, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to say them. Va'at and you, Oma va'az is kuli high, and you're going, what, any more accolades? We can barely say these accolades. Moshe Lebah Hadova Torah, right? In other words, we're now going to use a, um, you know, an analogy, a metaphor. Lamel Bas of Adam, a king, Shehoyolo Elif Alfim, Dino Izov. He has thousands of gold coins in his treasure chest. But Kalsal and Sibish Okez, they say, Wow, how much silver you have? He has gold. For Lord Gedai it's a deprecation. Kam this time in Divay Oisi Ishmael. So this is the end of the Gemara. Now, says the Gemara, let's reflect upon what's being said here. Okay? His boy in A for the Rishoyda. First of all, see, he couldn't take that he gave accolades to God, Kodesh Baruch Hu. very good, with the Baruch We don't like giving superlatives. 
is born in Gam Shom Mefurosh, you know, she was settled in Hog, a piece of lane of greater. Says the Ramba, says the Ramba, even more so. How we acted based upon our Seichel. It was not with the Kabbalah of Mishra, but I just got a But you know, I remember it's a Talmud law, we wouldn't use any accolades. You know, might be Peter Dovermack wouldn't say anything. In other words, had it not been, had we just used our Seichels, we wouldn't describe God by any attribute. Like I'm saying that I'm saying over here. Now, it's very interesting. You see, the Rambam obviously has a problem, meaning, in other words, how do we account for the fact that the Torah uses accolades? So the Rambam now actually gives an explanation. But once again, the explanation is being given as part of the Rambam's discussion of this passage in the Talmud. Very interesting. First of all, he shows, as the Rambam, that accolades are what you call a bidiyeva, not a chachila. At least, how we, at least not from the standpoint of our intellects. But he said, the fact is that accolades appear in the scripture. Why they appear in the scripture? Says the Rambam. Or put it this way, because people have to have an idea, have to have, in other words, you appeal to people, they have to have some idea of something. No, it's not everybody, and, and it says, like it says, Dib a Torah Kolosh and The Torah speaks the language of it. The Torah of him is a Kelbish like you say it. Somehow, well, when the Torah speaks like, in, in the language of man, the Torah has to ascribe perfections to God. Namely, what? Like this. The phrase Divra Taylor Blush Bani Adam doesn't ask doesn't mean this. Khas for Shalom and Shas. When the Gamal uses this, for example, the Dharma of Gimel, the Torah just says that sometimes an extra word of Taylor doesn't necessarily mean make a drasha from it. It's just the way people speak. But the Torah certainly, Dilta Blush Bani Adam, is not coming to make a theological statement. It's not coming to give a hetter for anthropomorphism. However, the Rambam was Bachadish, the Rambam. Establish a new concept of what this means. Then what Torah means that sometimes the Torah had to, in a certain sense, undercut the pure monotheistic idea in order to relate to people whose apprehensions were not as abstract. For example, in Parachavav, of the first head, the first section of the Marina Vochem, the Rambam raises the issue. If, in fact, right, you cannot, achieve, you cannot ascribe any anthropomorphic attribute to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, so why then does the Torah speak about the hand of God, Yad Hashem? Why does the Torah describe God as such? So the like, well, very interesting that you can't say, I'm mean, the the Torah wouldn't be martial people. I mean, why would the Torah be martial people? It's an interesting thing. The Bochon and Vasaman, there's a very famous piece of Bukhan, I'm sure you all know it. If you don't know it, you should be ashamed of yourselves. Go back to Yeshiva. In Kaibis Ma'amorim, there's a very, we all know from Hilchas Shuva in Perez Gimel, the Ram says a person who believes that a Kaddish Baruch Hu has a, an anthropomorphic, a human like description, he's called a man. So the Raibi there says, I know people better than him who believe that Kaddish Baruch can be described. But he suddenly has an article of, he's writing an article of, um, Meshataku, that's actually going to expand upon this, from Yitzhashem. And the fact is, as the Raivet, is that why do they, why do people think that Kodesh Baruch Hu has anthropomorphic features? Because they see it in the Psokim. From which, some people say, what, the Torah was Marshall people? So the fact is, um, you know, in the words, um, the Bachanan says that he asked his Rebbe, Rabchan Soloveitchik, I mean, how can it possibly? You can't blame the person. He's a total shogging. He's honest. The Torah used descriptions. How can the person be called an apikaitis? So, Chaya means the famous answer, Nebuch, and Nebuch apikaitis is Echem apikaitis. In other words, it's like a brisket table. It's not like it's an apikaitis. It's a chapter from apikosis. In other words, apikosis has nothing to do with the way you're thinking. Apikosis is a din. It's not if it's why you're thinking the way you're thinking. Whether you're guilty, whether you're innocent, it's not important. There's a thing called apikaitis. You either operate or not by apikaitis. It's like, like having white skin. No one asked you that you should, no one said to you, you have to have white skin. You were born with white skin. 
And like in Denver, because you have white skin, like there's an argument against racism, it's because, by definition, white skin is not good, or is good. In other words, brisca, brisca, it's a brisk up in that's Rabbi Chaim. Now, Rabbi Chaim, of course, argues on his Rebbe. This is not true, it depends. If a person really thinks Kodesh Baruch can be described by anthropomorphic, um, 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 anthropomorphic um, attribute because he's throwing the Chomesh, so he's an Anus. Anus Patrachmana. He can't help it. But if a person actually, you know, thinks about it, it comes to the philosophical conclusion that God must have a body, then he's an Api Kodesh. This is what Muhammad says. The fact is, is that what Muhammad says is very, very nice, but it's connected to Rambam. In other words, the real answer is, is that Rabbi Chon is raised an important question. So why did the Torah use anthropomorphic images? Why fool a person? It is an answer. Was a person supposed to read the Torah and then second guess the Torah philosophically decide that the Torah is really speaking in a metaphor? That doesn't make any sense. For that, Rabbi Chon has no answer. But I have the answer. The fact is the Rambam says himself that the Torah used anthropomorphic images because people, monotheism, is a very, very difficult, abstract concept that not everybody is capable of apprehending. If the Torah had not used anthropomorphic images, people would deny that there exists a creator. In other words, the Rambam's answer is the Torah preferred minus to a because to atheism, atheism. In other words, it was better that people have a perhaps incorrect concept of God than not to believe in God at all. That's what the Rambam says in Parachavot. And yet he claims it is an Ovid of Zara is better than a Min. Someone who believes God has a body is worse than an Ovid of Zara. Why is he worse? That's what the Rambam says. Ovid of Zara is giving to, to oh, you're right, right, right. But, but someone who says God's got a body is not as for the So the ah, so the question's like this. You have to say that I'm also like this. Is that that's true if the person is capable of thinking on an intellectual level, on a monotheistic level. But the person is not, then it's better to think that God is a body. That, that's what comes out of the word of Ucha. The Ram says in Mr. Taylor. It says in the Well, yeah. I don't remember the statement. Where is it? What, what paragraph? Alright, fine. Whatever it is. We'll get back to it. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to it. But, the fact is, now... The, the, would, that, the, would that be Shittuf? What? Would that be Shittuf in this what? case? What? Would, would be giving God a body in this case, that would be Shittuf? If, if, if he was a monotheist? No, Shittuf means that... The, the, well... Sheet of the sheet of we spoke about the Rambam is certainly not the monotheism required from the Torah. Well, the Vedas Zara is not clear to me in the Rambam. I know that the model of the Pope of the Pope's given me the Rambam El Kishani was was a Vedas Zara, but I'm not sure that's because of Sheet of because the Rambam speaks about mold. It doesn't call it Vedas Zara. It might be that the Christian stam worshipped idols. Mm. I'm not sure about uh -huh. that. That's uh -huh. a that that's a, 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 a luck discussion, which I'm, I'm not you know I'm not sure about that. In other words, even though Baal from the place given the the, the, the the Christians believe in Shittov, and therefore they're in Venezuela, but Shittov for the Rambam is like the modes and everything. The Rambam didn't consider Islam to be a Venezuela, even though the Islamic thoughts speak about the modes. So I think that the the Rambam's consider Christian to be a Venezuela is that they stop the worship statues. Oh, maybe they worship they they worship they worship Taisaish. Yeah. In any case, no, there, in any case, there is a big stela. Why in the Mishnah Torah does the Rambam, why in the Mishnah Torah does the Rambam call them Minim? But in Parachavav, the Rambam calls them, says it's fine, try to use it. You know what I'm saying? I would, I'll tell you what I think the right answer is. And I want to go to the Third chedek of the Meir Nevochem, in the Tamei Mitzvahs of the Rambam. The Rambam says clearly that when the Torah was given to the Jewish people, they were immersed in idolatrous culture. The Rambam says the reason the Torah Shemitz was given was to take idolatrous practice and somehow direct them towards the Kaddish Baal. But that's what the Rambam says. 
Which means the Ram understands that somehow at the time of the at the time the Torah was given, society was mo- a lot more idolatrous than it is today. In which case, I would say the following answer. Why did the Torah use idolatrous terms? Because at the time that it was given, at the time that it was given, if the Torah was not revealed to Bnei Yisrael at Har Sinai, when they left Mitzrayim, in terms of these terms, most people reject the concept of God altogether. One could argue that today, and the Mishnah Torah is being written in the 12th century, today, when in fact the world, in fact, has rid itself of idolatry, then in fact, the God would say, to believe that God has a body, you're a man. Because we're all accustomed, more or less, to the monotheistic idea. That's what I would say. And this is based upon the Rambam Shita in the Tamiya Mitzvah. The Mitzvah will get to it next semester or after Pesach, next Zman. Right? We'll speak about that the Rambam really understood that there is an anthropological evolution to man's belief in the Torah, which begins with the Chumash at, until through later eras. Ms. Alevechek in the soon-to-be-published lectures on Genesis, this is an interesting thing. He quotes a Protestant theologian, Karl Barth. That the Torah, that the Chumash, the Bible, you have the quote for me? You're not, you're not going to get it. That the Bible, the Chumash, is culturally relative. There's a misquote, actually, I changed it in my footnotes. Meaning that what? If the Chumash, if the Bible appears to appears to appeal to a geocentric understanding of the world. It's only because that's what people believed at that time. It's not the normal way in which I know. I realize it's not the normal way you learn Chobesh. But, when we saw the Vechik, in my opinion, he attributes it to Karl Barth, that's really the Ramba in Mary Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, the Chumash was said, right, with respect to the the apprehensions or the the conceptions of the Jewish people at that time in history. So that's very, very good. Now, does this diminish the truth of the Torah? Chas for Charlotte. Chas for Charlotte. But it just means that we have to think a little more deeply about what the truth of the Torah is. But in any case, that's what the that's what the Ram says. In other words, I don't so I don't think it's a stealer, a contradiction between the Megunavuchim and the Yana Chazaka. Okay? Okay, now, we're coming to an end. Um, we only have a few more minutes left. Um, really, to discuss the Ramah's concept of tefillah here, which he's going to go into, would actually take an entire Shia, which I'm going to leave in Yitzhak 7 for the 11th Shia, the 11th lecture. But, in any case, we see that the Rambam has used the, the, the Talmudic passage, Dibra Teva Kaloshe B'nai Adam, as not only being a description of a of a um, of a rule of exegesis, namely that sometimes we do not exegeti- find significant exegetically, exegetically, an extra word because sometimes the term will sometimes use an extra word because that's the way in which people speak. But the Ram Mash extrapolates the concept, meaning that just like the Torah says sometimes the Kumish speaks the way people speak, the Khumish sometimes look to think <laughs> the way people thought. That's actually the connection between the two. And because of that, the people thought of God in terms of hands and legs. It was much better to address that to people than to say God doesn't have hands and legs, then people would think God doesn't exist. Monotheism was a chiddish, was a tremendous novel concept at the time of the, that the Torah was revealed. And, and like the Rambam says in the Tamiya Mitzvah, was the Marna Volchem, Kodesh Baruch Hu cannot change human nature, and therefore because of that, the Torah had to adjust itself, or the Torah had to adjust itself to the in other words, to human nature, to the, the anthropo- and to the anthropological realities at that time. And that's what the Torah uses, um, uses such shyness and anthropomorphic image. But of course, in the Mishnah Torah, the Ram is ruling clearly that the Zmanazeh, certainly for the 12th century onwards, where the monotheist the concepts become much more accepted in society, the Ram of Sosa, and Blochem, and even Yoshke and uh, Muhammad brought the world closer to monotheism, even though it's not the Spitzmann of the Torah, 
Nonetheless, they brought the words close to that. So in such a case, a person actually believes that God has hands and legs, right? As I'm aware of that, this cannot be described by the Kodesh Baruch Hu, then certainly it's considered the men halach and So that's where, that's... The fiyani has daiti, according to Proverbs, in my opinion, that's the shita sarambam, and that's the, pros, the, the, the that's the resolution between the stila and the kaidish between the mishnah teira and the way nevuchah. Okay, like I said before, we're almost done. Um, I just want to make a few announcements. I want to um, this, the, um, these lectures. Uh, we, we, the camera was broken, so therefore, because of this, um, you're getting the lectures a little bit later. We want to um, we beg your indulgence. You know, things break. Um, I want to. Wish a mazel tov to Jake Greenberg. Um, you know that he had a baby, um, had a baby boy. I think. Um, he called me. Um, Jake is one of our Jake and um, Devorah. and Devora, of, of one of our chashev listeners. And I want to um, wish him a mazel tov. I think it's a boy. If it's a girl, it's a girl. Whatever it is, all the brachas. And of course, what, right? Amen. And, uh, and that's it. I want to thank everybody. And Amit Hashem, we will go further with the Meir uh, next week. Until that time, from an undisclosed location in Yerushalayim, Kol Tuf.